Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Stuart, for such a lovely introduction. I must say, it's lovely to see so many rosettes and so much purple. You all look fabulous. <laughs> I will start by saying that in my youth, I really wasn't interested in politics. Didn't, didn't entertain me at all. In fact, the year I turned 18, I only voted because my mum dragged me kicking and screaming down to the polling station and told me that if I didn't vote, I had no right to whinge when things didn't go the way I wanted them to, and that people that don't vote waste their votes, and that's not right. I believed that politics was for older, more educated people who understood how to navigate them, who'd studied them. I didn't realise that just normal people could make differences. I did know, however, from a very young age, that I wanted to make the world a better and safer place. The daughter of an ex-military father and a wonderfully supportive mother, who, while my dad was at work, raised four girls to be confident, strong women, I felt I had big shoes to fill to make them proud. During my school years, I wanted to be a solicitor. I wanted to work for the Crown Prosecution Service and put the bad guys in prison. I went to sixth form, studied law, psychology, English language and media, but unfortunately, due to an awful event where I lost two friends to a rogue landlord and carbon monoxide poisoning, that didn't go to plan and I dropped out of college. I tried the other avenue of training to be a legal executive. Um, I was put into family law, dealing with divorces and people that had, had their children taken away, which was soul destroying and it made me decide that the legal career that I was chasing really wasn't for me. I looked into joining the army, but um, damaged my leg, couldn't do that, and I wanted to find something that fulfilled me. I found hairdressing, which I thought was it, but something was missing, something I wasn't fulfilling my full potential. I spent so much time having politically charged debates with my friends, and complaining about the state of our politics. But I was so angry about the way our once great country was being destroyed, but it never occurred to me that I could make any difference. In my 20s, I thought that politics was reserved for older men and women sitting in the House of Commons arguing over big things, like new laws and immigration. I never realised how intertwined it was in every aspect of our daily life until I had my daughter it was then my eyes were truly opened. I realised how the things that are decided by the people in Westminster who are so out of touch with the common man affect everything in our daily lives. Like, ladies, value added tax on a tampon, because we all know this is definitely a luxury item. Um, they, they, cut, they cut the funding on schools year on year, and teachers are left to find that deficit on their own, buying things out of their own pockets to fill the classroom with things they need, because our government are too busy appeasing Europe to do what is right by our schools and our children. After 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU, we celebrated a monumental win and waited with bated breath for the day when we could claim our independence. But unfortunately, we've had to watch the betrayal caused by our bad joke of a now ex-Prime Minister as she's fumbled her way through several failed negotiations, missed deadlines, begging for extensions, and made a laughing stock of our proud people. I can honestly say after watching this for three years, I felt sick to my stomach. But typing angry statuses on Facebook and having political debates with my friends was never going to make any difference. So I made a snap decision one afternoon on the phone to my mother that I was going to join UKIP and run in the local elections. <laughs> when choosing a political party to align oneself with, there's several things you need to consider. Does this party represent who I am? Does this party represent what I believe? And does this party have a credible and deliverable manifesto? For me, there was only ever one choice, and that was UKIP. 
Even with an ex-party leader's new Tory light dangled in front of me, like a shiny light blue apple, I knew UKIP was the way forward for me, as we are a progressive for the people party who have no party whip, so our decisions are our own and not dictated to us. It remains the only true party that will make sure we get the best possible Brexit. After all, without UKIP, there would have been no referendum. There would have been no vote to leave. It was UKIP that motivated a nation to believe in itself and to vote for independence and freedom from the corrupt and tyrannical European Union, to embrace our true British nature, to keep calm and carry on, even in the face of the propaganda spouted by the biased broadcasting corporation and other left-leaning media outlets who are trying to sabotage the Leave campaign even after the result. We all know it's going to be hard for a little while, but we are a country that has survived two world wars, and as stated, we do keep calm and we do carry on. I've got a shocker for you now. As you can see, I am a woman. I'm a woman that hates feminism. I hate feminism and everything it stands for. Because I'm not a feminist, I'm an equalist. We must realise that equalism goes both ways, though. We must not assume it is only women that do not get treated equal to men. One of my personal pet, pet hates is feminists dictating to other women what they can and cannot do with their bodies. Two prime examples of this for the gentlemen are ring girls at boxing and grid girls at Formula One. Ring girls were introduced in approximately 1965 and grid girls were introduced in the late 60s. They've been accepted as a big part of both sports for a long time. And it is not just men who have appreciated these women, because I'm not being funny, I look at them and think they're gorgeous. But if we look at a true timeline of feminism, between the years of 1848 and 1920 was first wave feminism. This was primarily focused on women's right to vote. And I'm sure as many of us would agree here, it was a very noble and worthwhile cause. In the 60s was second wave feminism. And this was looking at equality in the workplace and equality to men, again, worthwhile. We've seen the rise of third and fourth wave, wave feminism beginning in the 90s, carrying on through the 2000s. These feminists are dangerous. These are the feminists that do not see themselves as equal to men, they see themselves as better. They are in essence taking freedoms away from multiple women by oppressing their choice of career. They are instead of empowering women by backing them and accepting their career as their choice, they are removing choice. If women choose to be objectified, who is another woman to say she shouldn't be? Another is this absolutely ridiculous notion that there's something criminal about wolf whistling and cat calling. I know I'm guilty of it. <laughs> in current society, it's considered totally unacceptable in a lot of people's eyes, the left, for a man to wolf whistle or cat call a woman. However, if a woman walks past a bunch of builders or a fireman, and we wolf whistle, not a word is said, no eyebrows are raised. I'm of the personal opinion that it's a compliment, but political correctness has gone crazy. And while we're on the subject of political correctness, I am going to tackle something that is close to both mine and Stuart's heart, and that is non-stun slaughter. Halal and kosher methods, for an example. I'm an animal lover, but I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan. I enjoy my steak too much. I'm very well aware that the food, the meat I eat was stunned before it was killed, so it didn't suffer. Or at least this is how it used to be. But with the influx and migration, it has become commonplace that many meats in our supermarket are now stealth halal. It's not labelled. We don't know that it's halal. We want to make it so that religious choice does not come before animal rights. I was unfortunate enough to catch a documentary on television showing the halal slaughter of a lamb and the brutal nature in which these animals suffer at the hands of these barbaric butchers. It was near soul destroying. 
I do not understand how this can be condoned in a modern society and would want us to put into policy that halal and kosher killing be irrefutably banned so that all animals are stunned before they're killed. But political correctness goes beyond wolf whistling and religious choice. Under the extreme PC rules and regulations our nanny state have implemented, I myself have had my personal Facebook erased for posting a political fact. Nothing aggressive, threatening, simply stating that a certain somebody, who shall not be named, ended up in Belmarsh for a, something that shouldn't have even been a prison sentence. Yet Gordon Brown, <laughs> yet Gordon Brown and Jackie Smith, who circulated an email to our police force, removing their right to investigate these grooming gangs and condemning little girls as young as nine to continue to be abused as they had made an informed choice about their sexual activity were never to be investigated. And within half an hour, Facebook had erased me. 11 years of photographs and videos of my children. 11 years of memories gone. Freedom of speech, freedom of political opinion denied. I believe our freedom of speech is something that needs to be protected and Facebook needs to stop erasing people it does not agree with. I also believe, as much as it is to be accepted, we have an issue with the hard right, the very hard right being the BNP and Britain first. There needs to be acceptance on a wider scale that there is a real issue with the hard left. Momentum, hope not hate, Antifa are dangerous, more dangerous than the hard right in my opinion. Yet the media continue to vilify us, continue to vilify UKIP and point fingers at us. Yet police have said on many an occasion, it's not UKIP or Brexit supporters that cause problems. More often than not, it is the hard left, it is Antifa. Yet the media refuse to acknowledge this and more needs to be done to combat the blatant propaganda that is being spoon-fed to society. I was elected on the 3rd of May this year and beat a Labour candidate by just 15 votes but 15 or 150, I still won and I hold that seat for UKIP. Thank you very much. My mum phoned literally every family member she could think of the day I got the result. If she was paying for her phone calls and didn't have free calls, I'd dread to think what her phone bill would look like. Being a counsellor is far from easy. It's one, besides being a mother, it's one of the most stressful things I've ever done. It's not, it's not easy, but let's face it, if it was easy, everyone would do it. It's stressful and it's time consuming, but it's rewarding. In my short time as a counsellor, I have helped secure specialist medical treatment for a gentleman who due to massive NHS cuts was refused a house call by a GP and he was den denied the referral he needed so that he couldn't have the, the surgery he needed to improve his quality of life. I helped to secure that treatment. I have helped rehome a family of six into a completely new county who were fleeing a potentially very dangerous situation. As well as these, my favourite achievement today occurred purely by accident. I was walking through Great Yarmouth Town Centre with my children when I noticed some motorcyclists very angry outside the butchers. I don't know if any of you have been to Great Yarmouth, but on our marketplace we have a small area that motorcyclists have used for parking for over 20 years. They have never blocked access. They have never caused problems. In fact, they are a deterrent to antisocial behaviour. The Borough Council took it upon themselves after one complaint that they were going to place an enforcement notice so that motorcyclists could no longer use that area to park. They were going to start issuing penalty fine notices. 
I spoke to the bikers who were understandably very upset. I asked them to email me and told them, like when you're riding together, the more noise you make, the more noise I can make for you. In the space of 48 hours, I had over 50 emails and I had that decision overturned. I am now working on pushing the local council to mark that out as a specific motorcycle bay and put in the horseshoes for people to chain their motorbikes to because we hold a wheels festival in Great Yarmouth where we invite bikers to come and classic car enthusiasts and monster truck drivers and our local businesses and our council earn a lot of money from these bikers and from these classic cars. And it's only right that as an apology and a thank you, they do what needs to be done to say thank you and we're sorry to these bikers. The work of a borough councillor, however, isn't always dealing with the larger issues. Sometimes it is just the day-to-day -day trivialities that interfere with everyday life, such as fly tipping, bins not being collected, neighbour disputes, noise complaints. And while I was on the drive down with Stuart, sometimes it's just yobs hanging around outside the back of a business and smoking something they shouldn't be. But I don't want anyone to feel that even if the complaint is tiny, that they are going to get treated like it's a tiny complaint. Every individual, I treat how I myself would like to be treated because I want to make sure I'm the best representation that I can be of myself and of UKIP. I'm currently working to uh, get a scheme off the ground in my local town called Haircuts for the Homeless. In my town, unfortunately, universal credit was trialled and we are a deprived seaside town anyway. We are on the east of the country. We always get forgotten about. We didn't get forgotten about, however, when the decision to trial universal credit was taken. We were one of the first victims. We are poverty-stricken, where a haircut is the last thing on the budget. And being a hairdresser by trade, I understand how much a good haircut can make in the way we are perceived and the way we perceive ourselves. Therefore, the scheme I'm setting up could help so many in such a massive way. My whole reason for wanting to get into politics is so that I can give a voice to those people that don't have one. Because at the moment, those in power do not understand the struggles of everyday people. They don't understand what it is to look in your freezer and know that your children are fine for the next couple of days, but what are you gonna have to eat? You're living on beans on toast. They don't understand what it's like to look in your bank and realize it's near to empty and you've got bills to pay. They don't understand the difference between the choice of buying shampoo and conditioner or putting gas and electric on the meter. And we need more normal people, pardon the way of saying this, but on the top, because the people at the bottom need to be properly represented. Politics has become a little bit of an addiction for me since taking my first bite of the political cherry and being elected into the position of borough councillor getting positive results for my constituents gives me a little bit of a buzz. But at borough level, there's only so much I can do. I have two years to prepare myself for the next elections, which are county, and I intend to use the two years I'm currently serving as my campaign for that. Because if I'm elected onto a bigger platform, it gives me the ability to look after the people in my hometown but I still can't affect anything nationally. What I would really like to do is concentrate on the possibility of when we have the next general election, if Richard wants me, I'm gonna be quite happy to run for Great Yarmouth for MP because UKIP was always... <laughs> UKIP was always very, very strong in Great Yarmouth. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of our branch when they did cross the floor, but I want to make sure that we can rebuild our branch, rebuild all the branches, and get into a position where we can make people sit up, listen, want to vote for UKIP, so we can concentrate on the things that actually matter. <laughs>